with the advancements we're seeing in artificial intelligence, I've come to realize that there is a very high probability that, you know, I will see artificial general intelligence and be able to make use of it in my lifetime. And I think it's going to happen within 10 years. Hi, Bob. Uh, welcome to the show. Really great to have you here. It's great to be here, Richie. I'd like to dive in uh, so and talk a little bit about your book, uh, The Datapreneur. So uh, first of all, can you tell me what is a datapreneur? Well, a datapreneur is, 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 sh is shortened for data entrepreneur. And the name came from when I was working with my co-author, Steve Hamm, and started writing a narrative of the book in the early, in the early days. We weren't really sure how we were gonna, what we were going to do, really, whether it was going to be a book or not, or how it would come out. And Steve had mentioned that he felt like there was a story in here for a book. And, uh, and, I, and after thinking about it a bit, I said, you know, Steve, I'd love to do this about the people. I'd make the story about the people I've worked with, the data entrepreneurs throughout my career, because I've been fortunate to work with some amazing people. And then immediately he shortened it to the, you mean the datapreneurs? And I thought that's a good name. So that's where it came from. Nice. And uh, can you tell me why you think uh, this sort of idea of entrepreneurialism is important in the world of data? Well, I think, uh, you know, creating things. I think creating things is important. I think learning is important. You know, I kind of feel like we're on this earth to understand everything about the universe and, and understand the world around us. And to do that, we need to create new things. And because you need the tools, we need tools to learn more. And that really comes from people who are entrepreneurial. And the realization I had, you know, and when I was writing this book, which was actually something that I, had, I didn't realize for all those years I was working at Microsoft, was that even though I spent over 20 years at Microsoft, a very large technology company, there are actually a lot of entrepreneurs at Microsoft. And I was fortunate to work with a lot of them. I wound up in my career uh, moving around in the product teams at Microsoft a lot. I tended to go into an area that was having problems or a new area for the company, spend a couple of years in there, get it started, and then move on to a different area of the company. And so I was fortunate to, to work with a lot of different people doing entrepreneurial work, particularly during the 1990s when Microsoft was doing, you know, doing so many things to lead the computer industry. It just seemed like a fascinating time um, uh, of Microsoft in the 1990s. In fact, your, your book opens with um, this sort of vision from Bill Gates back in 1990 about information at your fingertips. So uh, maybe you can tell me a bit about what that was all about. Yeah, in 1990, um, at an industry conference, which is long gone, but used to be the, the cat's meow called Com Comdex in Las Vegas in the fall, um, used to be the, the big show every year in, in, the, in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, Bill gave a talk that was a, a pretty milestone, milestone uh, a speech that he gave in 1990, where he described a vision of, of being able to get access to any information that you wanted from your desktop. And you have to put yourself in the perspective of 1990 and where things were. Most people did not have email. Email was, you know, unusual. There was no internet back then. Um, people were doing things on pencil and paper for for much of what business was was happening. Large companies had computers, but but people still worked, you know, with with uh, with pencil and paper and a lot of things. And so so PCs were really just growing back then. Uh, and and this vision was one where people could get access to any information that they needed to run to do their job. And while the approach that Microsoft took for, on it, which was a very PC centric, very Windows centric approach, was unsuccessful. The vision, I think, was incredibly successful, that, that the idea that we could get access to information, what really fulfilled the vision ultimately was the internet and, and tools like Google, which have, have allowed us to have access to incredible amounts of information. And of course, you know, people have access now to all sorts of information within their companies and, and, uh, and it just, you know, more and more data keeps coming at us. Absolutely. I'm the idea that um, information isn't accessible at your fingertips now just seems absolutely incredible. It does, doesn't so it? It, it, really was. <laughs> and it's, it's really, and you know, what's fascinating is, is the thing that's interesting, we'll talk more about this in the, in the podcast, is, is that what's happening now is we're moving from just being able to find this information to having these, you know, bots answer things for us, answer questions for us. You know, I find myself more and more just asking, asking questions 
um, of AI to get you know to find out information that you know to find an answer to a question I have, and it's the easiest and most and, and most convenient way to do it. Absolutely, um, and I, I would love to talk more about bots and AI in a moment, but um, I think there's still some some fascinating uh, stories you have from, from the, uh, your time at Microsoft that I'd love to sort of hear a bit more about. Um, so you have a, a great story about when you were working on SQL Server and you installed a data center in your house uh, so you could test the software. Can you just tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, in the early 2000s, I think it was about 2000. 2003 i was working on on a, a, a house you know here in 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 the seattle area and i was running at the time the windows server team and our management group and you know a number of different server products and the thing was is that is that that we were really targeting one of the things that was microsoft did a really good job of was building software that could be used by smaller companies and and uh, bringing business systems and, and databases and, and general business technology into companies of all sizes. Because again, you know, in the early 90s, most small business ran on pencil and paper, and, and that all changed with PCs. And, and mostly it was Microsoft software and then a set of applications that were built by third-party companies on top of that, you know, that software to allow it to happen. And we had built a product that was targeted at small businesses. Um, it was called Small Business Server, and it put everything together on one server, and it worked pretty darn well. Um, but, uh, mid-sized businesses, if you, if you, if what you were trying to do was bigger than that one server could do, you were pretty much on your own. And so I decided to set up what was essentially a mid-sized business, you know, in a data center, you know, in my house, it's actually just below me where I'm, I'm standing right in where I'm sitting right now. And, uh, uh, and at one point I had 11 windows servers running in that environment. Uh, and it was very complicated <laughs> to keep it running. It was, but that was the idea. The idea was to understand what it took to set up this environment and work with it. And so I was having people coming out all the time, fixing problems and things. And I would be in project reviews with the people that were running these teams. And sometimes I would know more about their software than they would, because I just spent the weekend trying to install the darn thing. And, you know, and I knew what the problems you know, were associated with that. And so it was very beneficial. It was a very beneficial hands-on experience. And in general, it, it's, it speaks to the attitude that I think is appropriate for people when you run organizations, which is to understand what's going on as best as possible and can get your hands dirty wherever you can. Um, you shouldn't do the jobs, certainly. You need to empower people to do the jobs, but you really want to understand what, what people are doing. And that, that was a, a firsthand way to do that in a circumstance which is pretty hard. Otherwise, who thinks, you know, Normally, people don't run this software. You have to be specialized IT people to run the software. So I just decided to put on an IT hat on weekends. That's pretty amazing. I think there's a great lesson to be learned there for anyone who's involved in developing products that you really have to actually like try using them yourself in order to ensure that they work as, as you expected. We used to call it Microsoft. We called it eating your own dog food. That was what we always called it. And and and. I mean, it was an important part of, the, of of what people did in building software. But, you know, when you're working on a word processor, you know, everybody can kind of relate to that. You know, a SQL database, you know, it's it's it's, it's not not everybody interacts with, with it directly. Let's say it, let's say that way. So you, IT does certainly. It seems like uh, that was a very sort of productive time at Microsoft in terms of um, making data more accessible. It's, just, um, it's like the big push for Excel, for SQL Server. Um do you have a, a sense of like what the the biggest impacts of of your work from that time or from Microsoft's work at that time are um, on on the data world? Well, I mean, I I really do believe that micro, Microsoft democratized data and and business computing for the masses. Um, if you look historically, business systems were big, expensive. You know, they they were they were the 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 space of very large companies. And what Microsoft did was it took that technology and it made it accessible to everybody. And, you know, and I'm very proud of the work we did back then because essentially we automated business. And we did that for literally, literally millions of companies around the world were able to get businesses automated because of, of, the, of the software that we built. And, you know, we may not have created the end application that they ran. If you're a dentist office, you run a dental application, but it was probably running on a small business server inside that dentist's office, you know, in the late 90s, or early 2000s. And, and, and so we were providing the infrastructure that made that possible. And, I would, and to me, that was a pretty amazing thing. You know, Windows, Windows Server really was the first uh, server system 
that brought that level of business computing out to a broad audience. You know, now we have the cloud and the cloud is an even more of a democratizing force because it's, it makes access even easier. Um, you know, it used to be you had to set up, bring in special people with white gloves and cranes and stuff to set up the mini computer. You know, we made it so you could just set it up on a little PC in the corner, you know, of the, uh, or in a, you know, in the closet. Uh, and now of course it's even easier. You just, you just all sign up for a service. It was a pretty incredible innovation back at the time. And I like that you've mentioned that, um, now everything's done in the cloud which is sort of essential part of the modern data stack. And of course, um, you were integral in building that uh, in your time at Snowflake. So uh, can you talk through first, like what does the modern data stack uh, consist of? So, you know, the modern data stack, which, you know, really didn't exist 10 years ago. I mean, it kind of came into existence in that I, I sort of say the 2015, 2016 timeframe, it started taking shape. And basically, you know, it's this idea that that with the cloud, you could run data analytics and you could deliver this data analytics first and foremost as a service so that, you know, people didn't have to run it themselves, that it, it could be run by another company on your behalf. And so you didn't have to understand how to set up the system and all those other things. So it was just delivered as a service, kind of like an application, but it's 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 a software service. You know, the second thing uh, that made the modern data stack really different is because it leveraged the cloud. Um, and, it, and in particular, as the technology was built for the cloud, of which Snowflake was really the first example of that, um, uh, it could scale, the databases could scale way beyond what they could scale before, and they could handle any type of data. Up until that point, Databases were very limited in how much data they could store and how many users they could work with simultaneously. So every company wound up breaking up their data into different databases that turned into effectively silos that had to be maintained separately and kept in sync. And it was a mess. It was just a complete mess because data was all over the place. It wasn't the same in, this, in different places. People were coming up with different answers for the same problem. Because they were looking at different numbers, because the systems they were working with were different, and it was it was because there were technical limitations that made that impossible, and the cloud fixed that by making it possible to essentially work with any type of data, to put data of essentially any size. I mean, you know, literally, you know, petabyte plus sizes of data you could start to work with, and then and then also it it allowed you to put as many users on that data simultaneously. Remarkably. A system like Snowflake, one, one you know, instance of Snowflake for a company can support an entire company. And there needs to only be one copy of the data. And everyone can see the same thing. And, and that technology is now, is now pervasive across the modern data stack. And then the third element of it, which is, you know, which is very important, is that, is that, is that SQL databases are, are used at the center of it. And the data is modeled for SQL databases. In other words, the data is structured in a way that, that, that these relational SQL databases, of which are quite mature today, are, are able to work with it. And you know, the, da the SQL databases I think of are the slicer dicers of data. They can chop it up and slice it any different way you want, look at it and aggregate it, put all these kind of functions on it. And they're just incredible arithmetic machines. Um, and, and collectively, those, you know, those things are core components. Now, it's gotten to the point where it's really a very complete solution. These, you know, the modern data stack, where you have ways of getting data in through data pipelines. You have tools to do data transformation to turn it into, you know, the state that you can work with it with the SQL database. More and more, there's tons of machine learning solutions on top. Obviously, BI solutions, tools like Tableau and Power BI. Um, really, there's just dozens of companies involved in it, and. We're now to the point where there are really five distinct modern data stack platforms. Um, two non-cloud providers, Snowflake and Databricks, they're sometimes called super clouds. They sort of sit across multiple clouds and provide a consistent experience across the physical clouds. And so Snowflake and Databricks have an offering, but there's also equivalent or roughly equivalent offerings from uh, Microsoft. Uh, with they just announced something called Azure Fabric or Microsoft Fabric, um, which is their modern data stack product. Um, uh, uh, Amazon has a whole set of products that collectively are provide a data solution. 
And then Google with their big query line has it. So we've got five different platforms people can choose from. And you know, if you're doing data analytics, you should choose one of them for sure. Uh, that is like, uh, yeah, just just pick one of the five and you're probably going to be fine. I mean, I have an opinion. I've <laughs> I'm an advocate of Snowflake. I will always be a Snowflake advocate. I help to build the platform so that it's appropriate that I have that. But I'm very. It's to me, it's very rewarding to see all of these platforms pursuing a similar path. And they're all trying to build a similar system. Now, they start in a different place. You know, Databricks started with the machine learning and Snowflake started with the, the, uh, the database, the analytic database and, or data warehouse. And, and so what you start with determines somewhat what you build in the end. But the products that all five of these companies are building are actually quite similar. That's interesting that you see that kind of convergence then that um, machine learning and like the data warehouse need to come together at some point. Um, do you have any other sort of trends you're seeing around that sort of thing then? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things have happened. Um, you know, one is, is that the uh, emergence of data lakes as a repository for all data has clearly become the approach that, that large companies are taking. And what's happened in the last couple of years is that there are now some industry standards for how you format data in a data lake to make it accessible, you know, to the modern data stack and do a SQL database. And so there's two technologies people are using. One is called Iceberg, um, which is preferred, which is what Snowflake has chosen as their primary solution. Google has also chosen it. And Amazon, I think, slightly prefers it, although I do believe they're supporting both. Um, the other solution is called Delta. It came from Databricks. And it is being supported by both Databricks and Microsoft right now. So you have two different formats. We're in a little bit of a beta versus VHS scenario, perhaps, on this, because we do have two different formats that customers can choose. My, my intuition says that some of these companies are going to support both formats. It is unlike beta and VHS, you can't build a recorder that supports both. You can't do that. Um, with, with this, you can. And you can support both. And I think we'll start to see that over the next few years, at least with some of the, the major cloud providers. Snowflake and Databricks are pretty set. I mean, Databricks is pretty much Delta and Snowflake is pretty much Iceberg. But we'll be interested to see what like an Amazon or Microsoft does. Okay, yeah. I mean, it does seem very common that you end up with two technologies competing. I mean, I guess um, at least a few years ago, it was very much like R or Python and both doing kind of very similar things in the data space. And yeah. Uh, there's tons of examples of these things. And typically one wins. I mean, typically, if you look at it historically, one tends to get more traction than the other, but we'll see over time on this one. Like I said, maybe because you can support both, it won't be that big, it won't be that big of a deal. I mean, the other big thing that, you know, we're seeing right now, the other big trend is injecting machine learning um, solutions into these data stacks and, and, you know, really the products to make it possible to build complete end-to-end -end machine learning intelligent or data applications. And those, you know, Snowflake just had a whole bunch of announcements yesterday. Um, today, Databricks is doing a whole bunch of announcements on this. There's, you know, there's a lot of new technology coming out that's making it easier for people to build solutions that incorporate machine, machine learning and in particular, the new large language models and artificial intelligence into their data stack. Um, the technology is very promising. Um, do you have any advice for organizations that are wanting to try and um, modernize data to start, try and adopt all this new technology? Well, I mean, right now, what I would say is that everyone should be looking at it and, and having people that are playing with it. I'll say that playing with it in the sense of trying to find solutions. One of the really fascinating things about this technology, and, and you know, the, the, it, it, it cannot be understated the importance of the large language model artificial intelligence technology that's emerged over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, for the first time, you know, we have intelligence in a computer program. We've never had that before. Independent intelligence, intelligence that's independent of human intelligence. I mean, humans could use intelligence and build a program and programmatically the machine would follow that very rigorously, it would always do a very good job of that. But the intelligence always came from the person. Now the intelligence can come from these, these models, these, these large language models and foundation models. And it's an incredible step forward because it allows you to put, put some glue essentially into every application to make that application more effective. And almost anybody can take and, and prototype 
uh, something, you know, if you have some technical capability, you can prototype something with GPT-4 and Langchain and, and, and a few other tools that you have and hook something up. And pretty quickly, like, you know, a week or so, come up with a demo that that is interesting and potentially compelling for a, a given company. Now, productizing that is a slightly different story and getting it into a format that's usable to your customers and and in particular is it, you you have confidence that it will not go awry that it will it will follow your values and do what you want it to do that takes a bit more work but what's encouraging is that you know the tools for enterprises to do this will, are going to emerge in the next 3 to to 12 months um, and, and right now, I mean, in order to do it, you know, you, you know, you have to grab your wrench and your screwdriver and your hammer, and you kind of put the whole thing together yourself and you can do it. Um, it's going to be much more straightforward because of these modern data platforms like a snowflake or a Databricks or, you know, Microsoft or Google, whatever, they're all going to make it a lot easier to build these tools. And we saw a lot of that yesterday in the announcement. Snowflake did a good part of what they announced at their summit this summer was tools to simplify the incorporation of AI into applications, companies. That's really interesting. I, I like the idea of what you said, that um, it's really easy to build a demo, but it's very hard to get like a, a robust product um, actually made in evolving AI. And it just seemed like there are so many companies just rushing to build AI into their products at the moment. Like basically everyone's doing it, uh, data company included. And so, um, yeah, can you talk a bit more about um, what, how you think um, it's going to be, e be made easier to build um, AI products? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, the first question everybody has to ask right now is, what model am I going to use in order to get my intelligence from? And you essentially have two choices. You can go with the commercial models like GPT-3.5 or GPT-4, which are very powerful um, and they're, they have the strongest reasoning capabilities, but they're relatively expensive to run. I mean, they're, they're costly. And, you know, for some enterprise solutions, that may be fine. There are certainly some solutions that are more general purpose where the economics of that don't work out very well. And, and the alternative is to look in the open source community at smaller models that are not as capable but are still quite capable and are much, much less expensive to run. And, and you know, here that world is changing at a, at a breathtaking pace. I mean, like every week there's new models being introduced in the open source community that are, you know, that are, have more parameters or that are, that are there. There's actually some standardized, some standardized benchmarks that are being used to qual to score these models in terms of their quality. And you know, there's no question that that something like GPT-4 is the is the strong as the highest quality. But in just a couple of months, we've watched open source models creep up um, and get better and better. And in many cases, they're good enough. And so, you know, incorporating those into a solution is still a bit tricky. Um, you know, you sort of you need to be somewhat of a data scientist to do it today. But that's going to change with these tool sets that are coming from the from the modern data stack providers. Um, in the last couple of days, Snowflake talked about AI factories, which are essentially a way in which you can do the uh, the fine tuning. You take a, a pre-trained model that's already been built by somebody else, and then you fine tune it with your, your customer data to actually understand the characteristics of your particular application. And then you can apply that, and then you can apply that into, into a solution. You know, the other technology that is very much hand in glove to this that that has emerged as being very important are vector databases. Um, vector databases are uh, a, a storage mechanism or a database that can store content, quite often text, um, that is associated with a certain, that, that, that has a certain semantic associated with it. So what you do is you take, you take, uh, text that you have, maybe your product support messages or your Slack internal messages or any, any corpus of information that is interesting. And you run it through a large language model that creates these vectors or these embeddings that are numbers, you know, in a multidimensional space that describe the semantics of what the meaning of what that text is. And then 
uh, you can store that in a vector database and then perform what's called a vector search against it or a similarity search to find similar, where you literally you ask a question and you run it through that same embedding model, you get a set of vectors out. You can hand those vectors to the vector database, which will look for similar patterns and then give you text content that is consistent with that question. And then, you know, if you feed, if, 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 if that text has the, has the answer to the question that, the, that you're, is being asked, if you feed that into a large language model, you're much more likely to get an accurate answer. So it's a way of taking, you know, it's a way of taking knowledge that you have inside your organization and combining it with intelligence because the two are hand in hand. I mean, we've always databases and, and, and data storage and the internet has always been about the accumulation of, of data and ultimately knowledge. And the difference between data and knowledge is that data is raw information. You know, knowledge is, 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 is it that information that's been analyzed, some sort of analysis has been done on it, and conclusions have been reached from it. And that's, it becomes knowledge when there's some conclusion um, that comes from it. And um, what's interesting is that knowledge that's been generated by people can be provided to these large language models, and, and they, they are better. But they also are helping to generate, you know, they also can go through this process of, of analysis and actually generate knowledge and answers from, from raw data, which is also another quite exciting thing that you can do with these language models. Um, Thank you. There's a lot to unpack there. I never, um, so, <laughs> there's so much you can do yeah. right now. I mean, there's just so much you can do right now that literally you couldn't do 18 months ago. I mean, none of us could do it, and now we all can do it. Absolutely. It's very, very exciting times. Um, so I'd maybe like to get a bit more into vector databases. I, I feel like um, when it comes to generative AI, um, the, the, sort of the large language models take a lot of the limelight, but actually like you need to combine them with a vector database to, to really uh, unlock the power. So um, I think, I think you've mentioned Pinecone briefly. Do, uh, do you want to talk a bit about like maybe what's happening in the vector database space? Like who are all the different players and what can you do? It's really funny because, you know, a year ago, or nobody even knew what this stuff was. I mean, a vector database was like, vector what? Um, and and it, because these language models and the embeddings that they created create are effectively vectors, um, they've become very, very, you know, important. And essentially, they're just a way, essentially, they're just a way of storing information that that, that is associated with some sort of semantic. And that's that's the really key thing is, is that if you look at if you look at how um, search has historically worked, it's historically been a textual based search where you're looking for key you know words in, in, in text. And that's you know the way we've we've done it for now. It's not the way it's gonna that's simplistic going forward. I mean, in the future, I think what people are what we're gonna be doing more of is 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 taking and 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 taking information vectorizing it, running it through, through, through machine learning models to actually understand the semantics that is within the, that, that, that content. And then using, using uh, you know, more natural language questions to ask, to, to find that information, and then augmenting the model with knowledge that comes from the vector database. So if you can give a model, see, here's the thing. If you, if you take a model, here, you take, take even GPT-4. GPT-4 was trained two years ago. So there's no information that's more relevant, that, that's more up to date than that. The way you can bring it up to date is by providing it with more information in the, in the question that you're asking. So you can take and, and take information that you, that if you, if you have a question that you're asking, you can you can vectorize that and get the semantics of that question and look in the content that you already have to find relevant content and then feed that to, to the, to the, to GPT-4, which will then give you a much more reliable answer. It's pretty amazing stuff. And so for organizations who are wanting to, um, to adopt generative AI products. So, um, where do they get started? Cause it seems like there are so many different technologies and they're all moving pretty quickly. The first thing I would say is get your data assets in order. I mean, that's the first thing, which is, you know, most companies are still not fully on the modern data stack. I mean, this is, you know, we've still are, we're still in the transition 
to the cloud for data analytics. And you really have to have, have done that in order to, to really be able to take advantage of this. You need to get your data together in one place. You need to have it in a solution where you can govern it and, and manage it. One of the really important things to remember is that when you take your data and you bring it all together, you need to secure it. Because, I mean, in, in an odd way, when data is under a person's desk, it's oddly secure, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to get to that information. But when you have it in a centralized situation, you have to really determine access control and things like that, which is really what the modern data stack is all about, which is being able to accumulate all your data in one place, provide access to that information in a governed and controlled sense so that the people who have access should have only the access they're allowed and others shouldn't be able to get at it. Now, once you've done that, you know, now, I mean, again, I think you, 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 know, you, you look at your modern data stack provider, whichever one you're on, and probably look to the tools that they're providing or the partners that they're working with are providing to help to facilitate this process of building these intelligent data applications that include, include artificial intelligence and large language models. I mean, there are a, a small number of organizations, you know, on the planet they can just push all the stuff together and they have the chefs and the, you know, the, the data engineers to do it. But most companies don't have that expertise. And the fortunate thing is, is, is we're just literally months away from not needing that expertise. So right now I would experiment, I would play, I would try and understand what applications are the most valuable. I would really focus on, you know, which, where, you know try and understand where you want to build something. And then I would, you know, work with your provider, your modern data stack provider, whether it's Snowflake or Databricks or Microsoft or whoever it is, and, and, and work with the tool sets and the partners that they encourage you to work with to actually build these solutions. Because again, the tools are going are gonna to improve at a very rapid pace, very rapid. That does seem like a really important point, though. This worth repeating the idea that you do need to get all your data uh, into a sensible position, understand what you have and make sure it's accessible by the right people before you start thinking about, um, like kind of, kind of put this into AI. Otherwise you're just data wrangling. You're just messing around. You know, your, your, your biggest issue is just finding the data and getting it into the right format. And fortunately, you know, that was a problem that was really hard to solve eight years ago. And now it's a very solvable problem. It's a very solvable problem for any organization of any size. Um, you know, people just have to go through and do that. And, and that is a core step in preparing them to really move forward into this artificial inte intelligence world. You touched upon um, data privacy briefly, but uh, more generally, can you um, provide some guidance on how companies can use AI uh, in an ethical manner? Is it privacy or privacy? I always joke about that. It's... <laughs> Is it... I'm very British in my pronunciations. <laughs> it comes out the British side of it comes out. I just had to, I had to kid you there, Richie. Um, uh, the, you know, it, it's, this is a key issue for everybody. And, and, and honestly, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for any organization to do this. And while the tools exist, you know, in the modern data stack to, to actually enforce the privacy and things like that, um, the hardest part is actually understanding the roles within your organization and making the business decisions as to who gets access to what data. And this is actually incredibly important. I mean, it, 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 you know, it's something everybody cares about, you know, data, how you manage other, how you manage your customers' data is of concern to everybody. So building those policies, establishing those policies as, you know, in, in, in essentially in stone, I mean, making them very, very rigid and well understood within your organization, and then implementing them through your technology stack are really critical. And, and it's, it's something that every organization needs to do as they centralize their data. And it's, it's actually one of the hardest things. It's honestly one of the hardest things because you have to make a bunch of business decisions as to who gets what information, access to what information. And that's somewhat, you know, it's the people side. The technology is always challenging, but it's always the people side of these things that is the most challenging. Oh yeah, certainly. I'm sure, like you tell data scientists, they're not allowed to they don't access like particular they don't data like sets. Yeah, or marketing people. I mean, but but you really have to ask yourself what what information should you know, your product marketing people have access to? I mean, it's a fair question, right? And you know, if you're in the sales organization, you should probably have access to your customers, but not somebody else's customer information. Are there any sort of common mistakes that you think businesses make when it comes to this? Um, so they just don't do it. They just don't do what I just described. 
I mean, honestly, people don't put the, the, the they, they do not, we didn't at Snowflake. I'll just say this. This was Mark, one of our early on, one of the biggest things was gaining control. We did this years ago. I mean, it's been fixed for years, but, but, but early on making sure that, that only the right people have access to all of the information. Now I have to distinguish in Snowflake, it's really important. There's customer data that customers would load into Snowflake. And we never had access to that. Never, never. Um, but then there's all the data we collect about that, which was a tremendous amount of information. And some of it, which you could consider reasonably proprietary, like schema information, things like that. And, and so it's really important that, that that information only be accessible to people in the circumstances within a company where it's appropriate. Um, to do so. And it really is a policy conversation. That's right. The hardest thing about this isn't even enforcing it in the systems. It's establishing the business policies around it. And, and, and almost nobody had this a few years ago because, again, the data was all over the place. Nobody could find it. It's very secure when you can't find it, it turns out. <laughs> uh, th that's absolutely fascinating. And to say, like, this sort of general theme is like, if you want to use AI, you got to do data governance right. It's kind of like, um, you know, if you want to play with your toys, you've got to clean your room first. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> the thing about it is, is that you really want to be careful because you want to make sure that when you are, for example, doing fine tuning on these models, that you're doing so in a way only with information that should be put into those models, right? You don't want to, you don't want to contaminate those models with data that they shouldn't be looking at. Because especially the, you have very little control. I mean, it's only it's statistically once the data is in there, it's statistically determined what the damn thing is going to say, right? You we only have we don't have direct ability to control it. We only have indirect like, control it by by tweaking the weights associated with the, the neural network. And I suppose um, that's kind of it's, it's one of the hardest things to deal with then because it's only going to cause a problem very occasionally. So if you got like a one percent chance of um, or even like 0.1% chance of like some data like being regurgitated by the AI, it's only going to like appear well, very it's occasionally. Ter it's a terrible thing because it's indeterminate when it would happen. But I'll make the point, it's not hard if you set it up correctly to begin with and you only do the training or fine tuning on data that the model should be looking at. It's fine to fine tune this model on a specific customer's data as long as that fine tuning is associated with only that one customer, right? I mean, that's a fine thing to do. And in fact, that's exactly the way some of these new products are working. One of the, you know, one of the companies that I'm involved with is called Dakugami. Um, and what they're focusing on is using these, these uh, large language models to, ex to take a business contract, you know, which is formatted. It's very formatted in a way that text and paragraphs and things like that. And inverting that contract into a, a data document that describes the data within that, that contract. And then allowing you to use that to build new contracts and things like that. And, and you know, the way they have done this and managed to maintain privacy, which I think is, is, a, is, is, is a, uh, a best way to do it, is, is they have, they, they, they took a model. They have, they, it's all done through open source models. And they have, they, they use a standard open source model that, that's been trained on um, you know, general in, information. Then they do additional training on that model with business contracts that are openly available on the internet so that are similar to customer contracts but are not that don't have customer relevant data in it and then and they call that the green loop okay the green loop because it's all safe everything's safe in there and then when you read it then when you load documents you know to do the analysis you load a number of documents these contracts into docugami and it goes through what's called the red loop where it does another level of, 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 of fine tuning and training that's based on the contents of that customer set. But that information is all contained within a customer and it never escapes from that customer. And that's the right way to do it, you know, where you have general open training to understand English and understand general business terms, things like that. But then when you're dealing with the specifics of a business and a specific of a customer, that training has to stay isolated. And, you know, again, this is doable. You just have to do it. You just have to structure it. And the tools will facilitate this over time. Okay. So uh, it just sounds like um, 
the, the tooling is not really the problem. It's just, it's really a case of getting those business processes right to make sure that you're very clear on what data is public, and they'd what data is private, what data is, right? Yeah. I mean, the, you know, like, yeah. like, look, the Dokugami team did, these are data scientists. These are sophisticated engineers. I mean, this is top people in the world doing this. And they built a bespoke system that's specifically designed to do what they're trying to solve. That's great. They're an ISV. They can do that. You know, if you're a, a enterprise and you're trying to incorporate this into your business applications, you know, you probably want to use tools that help facilitate it. And again, while those tools don't quite exist, and we're just on the cusp of a whole bunch of things coming out. And within 12 to 18 months, it's going to be, we're going to go from rags to riches, I think. I absolutely look forward to that. That sounds amazing. Um, I want to take a little sidestep into science fiction now, because y you mentioned Isaac Asimov like several times in your book. And so I like to know a bit about how Isaac Asimov um, in his science fiction and other writing, uh, he's influenced your opinions on AI. Well, I, you know, I, when I was young, um, I read a large amount of Isaac Asimov's novels. The man was unbelievably prolific. I mean, he, he, he wrote and edited almost 470 books, which is crazy. Having written one book and knowing how difficult it is, the idea of 470 is beyond my comprehension. Um, and, you know, he wrote about intelligent machines in the form of robots, you know, 70 plus over 70, almost 80 years ago, for goodness sakes. And, and, you know, he first defined these things he called the laws of robotics in the early 1940s, uh, before digital computing was invented, if you can really even imagine that. And, you know, he, he was the first writer to imagine an intelligent machine as, as something that is a tool created by man to help people versus some, you know, being that we shouldn't have, you know, Frankensteinian being that it was that, you know, that we were tampering with God. I mean, that was everything before that was when, you know, anything, anything of a, of any kind of legends or anything where people were creating some entity or machine, it was always, we were tampering with God before then. And you know, Asimov didn't see it that way. He saw this as as a technical project, and and you know he did, he was the one who coined the term robotics, you know, which is really the technology of building building robots as tools to help people. And he very much saw that these that 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 there's be a, a lot of complexity of intelligent robots living and working with people that are highly imperfect. And, you know, he came up with these three laws, the initial three laws of robotics, you know, that a robot may not harm a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. That's the first law. A robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. That's the second one. And then the third law is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Well, his stories, you know, that he wrote in the 1940s and the 1950s on robotics were really parables of, you know, essentially machines that were perfectly obeying these three laws, interacting with much less perfect humans um, and the challenges of that. And, you know, one of the, one of the, the criticisms um, the, of, of, of Asimov's laws is that, you know, is that, it, is that what does it mean to injure a human being or to allow an in, a human being to come to harm? Of course, it's a very vague term. And, you know, and we could think of that in very broad ways. Well, it turns out that Asimov's writings were largely about what that term means. I mean, he he explored across these different stories, different kinds of harm and, you know, and how that harm was inflicted and, you know, and, and how the robot had to respond to that because it was following the laws. And I just think that these ideas of 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 these laws, which were burned into the brains, a positronic brain that Asimov invented. We aren't going to have anything quite like that with our AI and large language models. The, you know, we can't burn laws into the, the neurological circuits of, of, of a large language model. But, but we can build the rules in which these, these things operate. And I do believe these laws are, are, are useful, are, are useful guidelines for, for us as we create intelligence. And the other thing that to me was 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 even more remarkable is that um, Asimov put aside the robot stories for almost thirty years, and then he came back to them in the nineteen seventies. 
and um, he wrote a few novels um, late in his career. And in those latter novels, the, the, some of his robots were more advanced and had become what we might call a AGI or artificial general intelligence, or maybe even a super intelligence. And you know, in Asimov's writings at that point, these robots were ha interacting with you know leaders of, of human society and having um, an influence on on it. They're very really benevolent, okay, because they were following the laws. But they real the you know in it the robots realized that the laws were insufficient, and Asimov added what he called the zeroth law, which is you know a robot may not harm humanity, or through inaction allow humanity to come to harm, you know. And when you hear you know Jeffrey Hinton and, and folks talking about existential risk of artificial intelligence, it's really about what happens if these things become super intelligent and get beyond us. And you know, there again, I just really think that that what Asimov was trying to say is we need to make sure we put rules and regulations in place to ensure that the tools that we're creating, these entities, whatever they are, are actually working on our behalf. And again, I think that this is is a good approach to to it's not you're not gonna that's not how you build the large language model, but it wasn't how you built the positronic brain either in in, in there. It was simply it was simply the rules in which these things should operate. I just think there's a lot to learn from it. Absolutely, it just seemed like um, like fiction, uh, science fiction in particular, is very good for trying to figure out you know how the how the future ought to be. Well, it's remarkable. The timing even is about right. I mean, even if you looked at where he was talking about, it was like the 2030s and stuff. I mean, it was all roughly the same time frames and that that he was talking about. You know, I mean, I think he was a prophet. I just really think he was a prophet. And he, you know, and he and and there's a lot we can learn from what he wrote. Absolutely. It may be time to dig out some of his uh, books from the, from the library, I think. You know, one of the most enjoyable parts of, 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 the, of writing this book is I've reread a whole bunch of the Asimov robot things and robot novels and robot stories, and they're really great. They're really fun. They're old and somewhat quaint, perhaps, but they're really wonderful. Well, we're talking about uh, the, the future of, of AI and things like that. So in, your book has um, something you call the arc of data innovation. Uh, with sort of different steps that lead towards um, the idea of a uh, technological singularity. I think, it's, uh, I think it's one of Ray Kurzweil's uh, ideas. But um, can, you just, can you tell me a bit more I about book, um, right? what this arc is? Book right here. <laughs> oh, he's got his book. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, let me say when I first started writing the book, you know, I knew there was there was there was always an arc of data innovation. You know, that was a part of the book, and it was an important important element of it. But two years ago, when I first started writing it, I really thought the arc ended in, you know, in the data economy and how data is going to change our world and it has been changing our world. And, you know, what's happened is, and, and to me, the big thing is, is, that, is that with the advancements we're seeing in artificial intelligence, I've come to realize that there is a very high probability that, you know, I will see artificial general intelligence and may, be able to make use of it in my lifetime. And I think it's going to happen within 10 years. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I had thought that the horizon for this, I've always believed this was coming. I mean, as an Asimovian, you know, as a kid writing the Asimov, I always believed these robots were going to come someday. But I thought it'd be 2100 or something that we would see this. And, you know, and therefore I didn't think I would see any of it. Um, but now I think that, that, you know, you know, even a 60 plus year old will see, you know, AGI and perhaps super intelligence um, and, you know, a technological singularity. Let's talk about what it is. A technological singularity is an, is, is an advancement in progress that is beyond human speed. And what we've been seeing, you know, in a way for thousands of years, but very much since the advent of the digital computing is an acceleration of progress. And that's what's represented in the arc of data innovation. It's really an acceleration of progress. Things are going so much faster. You know, I go back to when Bill did his information at your fingertips speech, things moved a lot slower than, than they move right now, St stunningly slower than, th than they move right now. And, you know, we have continued to see this pr progress in acceleration of of pace of, of technological innovation. And there is no question that these, this, these artificial intelligence systems that we're building are going to accelerate that. It will accelerate that. 
And another potential major accelerator is quantum computing. If you know, if and when we see that, I didn't put that in the in the in the arc, but it's another big one potentially. And and ultimately on this, you know, it's going to continue to keep getting faster and faster. Does it ever get to the vast fast point where we can't keep up? Well, I don't know. That's what a singularity sort of is. And if that does happen, I just want to make sure that wherever it's going, it's going in a direction that's beneficial to to mankind. And um, uh, I think we can do that. I think we can achieve that. I'm, I've always been a technical optimist. I've always believed that you can specify what you want to build. And I think we can be successful in this. I've said that's like one of the bolder claims made on the podcast that we're going to have artificial superintelligence in our lifetimes. Um um, I'd be amazed if you, if you're if you're right. That's uh, that's going to be <laughs> it's going to be astounding. Well, you're going to have artificial. Like you, I, I think you're going to have artificial general intelligence, really, because it's 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 getting there at a very at a fairly rapid rate. I mean, it really is. It's getting it's it's, it's increasing reasonably fast. Whether it gets you know progressively smarter, that's that's a really interesting question. So, uh, you think uh, do you think there are going to be any important issues that um, these sort of uh, more powerful AIs are going to be able to solve in sort of humanity's near future? Well, I think they're going to help us in all kinds of things, right? I mean, I think they're going to help us to accelerate medicine, medical science and drug discovery. They will help us, you know, in diagnosis of medical issues. You know, they're going to automate business processes and make business processes more efficient. Um, you know, they will help us in, in, you know, all kinds of potential discoveries. I, I think that, that, we're going to see a couple of major, you know, between AI coming out and being able to see some and solve some problems, and then potentially quantum also coming. Um, it's you know, quantum can solve a whole set of problems that are essentially completely unsolvable in the digital space, and so it's going to be a fascinating time frame. Um, there's a lot of discovery out there. We don't know very much about the universe, and we're learning. There's a lot more to learn, and we're learning it faster and faster definitely agreed there's so much more exciting stuff out there to learn always always um yeah so um do you think there are going to be any sort of unexpected consequences once you have incredibly powerful ai there's gonna be all sorts of unexpected you know the thing about this and this is really important you know we we're talking about the existential risk a second ago that's the long-term risk you know in terms of, of super intelligence the short-term risks are that these are powerful tools that can be used by people to do things on behalf of people. And like every other tool created by man, it will be used for every possible purpose, you know, the good, the bad, and unfortunately, the evil. And, you know, we've, everything we've ever built has been used that way, right? I mean, every, everything, you know, the hammers have got lots of positive uses and they have some negative uses too. And, um, you know, some things are just purely, I mean, the one thing that I think is purely negative is nuclear weapons. You compare AI to nuclear weapons. To me, they're incomparable in one sense, which is that there's no productive use of a nuclear weapon. And there's millions of productive uses of AI. Um, uh, those potentially have some existential risk. Although, if you, if you ask me, I'm still more worried about the nuclear weapons, I think, than I am about the AI in terms of existential risk. But, but, um, uh, but that's, I was a Cold War baby. I grew up, I grew up in the, in, during that era. Um, you know, the duck and cover era. So I remember, you know, I remember, I remember what that was like. Um, but you know, we will, we, we're going to, people are going to do everything with this and, and, and there's going to be, you know, we're already seeing, you know, terrible deep fakes being built. Um, you know, it seems like every day the news has some new story of AI, whether it's positive or negative, whether, you know, it's, it's some new horrible deep fake that somebody's doing to, you know, cause problems. Or whether it's a new Beatles song that includes John Lennon's voice in it, be created by artificial intelligence, which I would say is a, you know, certainly a positive thing you're doing, it can be done. Absolutely, I mean, it's just such a huge range of possibilities for for good or bad with this thing. So maybe can you tell me like what you're most excited about um, uh, as far as AI goes? Well, I guess you know it's hard to it's hard to put a finger on this because every single thing is going to be reinvented. You know, it's, it's again, it's it's. You have intelligence in a computer now for the first time. And for the first time, a computer can actually understand and respond to English and other natural native languages. That's remarkable because it lowers the it lowers the barriers between man and machine dramatically. You know, I people have been talking about these autonomous vehicles, all these things. You still need a way of communicating with the device that you're dealing with. I mean, I always wondered, you know, until until like last last this year, 
I was wondering, well, how are you going to, when we have these automate, autonomous Ubers that, that take us from place to place, how are we going to tell the, the, the car where to drop us off in the end? Because every Uber conversation, every Uber ends you know, in a short drop conversation with the driver about where to drop you off. And now it's like, okay, you'll just tell the car and they'll, they'll know what to do. So the fact that you can use English. So like, for example, you know, SQL, which has been such an important language in data analysis. I mean, it's the lingua franca of, of databases. I mean, it's going to become more of an intermediate language and English is going to become the primary language for data analysis. And people are going to express their queries in English, which will then get translated into SQL. It's still going to get translated into SQL. But English is going to become much more important. And, you know, that was not really foreseen as possible. I mean, there's a number of people trying to do it, but, but it's only become really viable in the last really six months. Absolutely. I mean, doing data analysis with just natural language is just such an amazing uh, improvement in many cases. Uh, absolutely brilliant, not having to remember SQL syntax. Well, and the moment, at the moment, the only model that's doing a decent job of it, I think, is GPT-4, actually. I mean, I don't even know if, if I don't know if there are any, you know, that when I hear people are working with translating into SQL, they seem to be using GPT-4 because they need the reasoning capabilities that that model has. So like I say, it's really recent that this seems to be breaking through. Um, I, I suspect my, my view is that in, in 12 to 18 months, there'll be open source models that'll be capable of doing that. But right now, it's, it's not true. Uh, all right. So before we wrap up, a um, couple of uh, not AI questions for you. Or, well, there, there could be AI depending on how, how you answer them. So um, first of all, like um, if you, you've been involved in like so many different companies over the years. So I'm just wondering, if you were going to start a new company today, what sort of area would it be in? Well, I think, you know, what I would say to anyone is, under you take whatever domain you understand and and see how you can use intelligence in the form of the AIs to actually reinvent that space because every single application space has a potential to be reinvented with AI now it'll be interesting you know AI can be additive to existing applications so it's not clear that there'll be that that the incumbents are going to lose in this battle and if they if the incumbents do a good job of incorporating the intelligence you know, they're well positioned to be successful going forward in whatever category you're talking about. Like, for example, Adobe just added, you know, added generative AI capability to Photoshop. That's an example of how an incumbent can take and augment their tools with, with AI. Um, you know, will that be the successful road or will be a successful road of a whole new product in that space? Unclear still right now, still unclear. Um, but there are whole new categories that can be, you know, that can be created. One of which, which, I mean, my favorite one that I'm personally really interested in is understanding the semantic model of a business, understanding all of the nuances of that business and then having that be effectively structured in a business system. You know, I think that takes the form of a knowledge graph of some kind that needs to be created. That technology is also still emerging. So it's just a whole, you know, new areas. But the capability of using intelligence to be able to actually determine the business, the business uh, uh, process is is very powerful because in many of these large companies, I think the process have become so complicated people don't even understand them fully. And AI can help. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the idea that you know start with like what you know and then just think about how these new technologies can help you out. Uh, so yeah, just seem like that some great opportunities there for uh, anyone. So I guess uh, just to finish, um, do you have any more? advice for aspiring data printers follow your dream really i think it's a great time if you have an if you have an idea if you would like to be you know to be entrepreneurial it's a great time to do it it really is a good time there's a lot of you know there's a lot of new things you can work on uh it's a very brave new world with this new technology you know nobody has too big of a lead on it right now so there's just a lot people can do but you know take what you know and 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 apply it in a way that really solves problems in a different way for people. I mean, but leverage your strengths. That's my best thing to say to everyone. Leverage your strengths. Uh, great advice. Uh, thank you so much, Bob, for coming on the show. There's loads of great advice throughout. Uh, that's been, it's been great having you. Great, it's been good here. Good talking to you, Rashi.